Kia ora team, my name's Ben and let's talk Starling's Law of Capillaries or Capillary Exchange. So basically, how does fluid move in and out of our capillaries? So Starling's Law is the rate and direction of fluid movement across the capillary wall is dependent upon the balance of hydrostatic and oncotic pressures. So let's talk hydrostatic pressure first. So hydrostatic pressure is like a piston pushing fluid across a capillary membrane and forcing it through to the other side. So if we got high hydrostatic pressure, fluid moves out, so pushing fluid out of the capillaries. And then with osmotic, remember FFS, fluid follows solute. So fluid is gonna move through a semi-permeable membrane towards an area of high solute concentration. So if we've got lots of solutes on one side of a semi-permeable membrane, they're gonna pull fluid towards them. Okay, now with our Starling's forces, we've got four forces. We've got our blood hydrostatic pressure, the blood pushing fluid out of the capillary. We've got our blood colloid osmotic pressure which is the osmotic pressure pulling fluid into the capillary. And then we also have the same hydrostatic and osmotic pressures in our interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid is the fluid that's outside of the cells and outside of our capillaries, so sitting through here. But this is kind of inconsequential because most of the proteins or the fluid that gets left in that interstitial space gets mopped up by a lymphatic system and then returned into our venous system. So mostly when we're thinking about it, we can just think of our blood hydrostatic and our blood osmotic pressures. So when we think about it, we can think of it as like a tug of war and the blood push is the hydrostatic and the osmotic pressure in the blood is the pull. And then in a tug of war, the interstitial fluid, osmotic and hydrostatic pressures, they're like your little brother or little sister who comes to help with the tug of war. Cool story for coming to help, but you don't make that much of a difference. Okay, now if we look back again, here's our heart. When the heart contracts, we shoot out 120 millimeters of mercury force right there in the artery. But by the time the artery turns into the arteriole and then eventually gets to the capillary end, then that force is kind of dropped because it's so far away from the pump. And now the blood hydrostatic pressure is probably closer to 35. And so that is the hydrostatic pressure pushing out. And our blood colloid osmotic pressure this is the big stuff that is in our capillaries. So our red and white blood cells, our platelets, and our albumin, this is big stuff with an osmotic pull dragging fluid back into the capillary. So that's about 25-ish. So at our arterial end, the net filtration pressure will be maybe 10 millimeters of mercury leaving. So that's filtration. So what leaves? It's not this big stuff, because it can't leave, but little stuff can get through the capillary wall, through these gaps. The fluid leaves, and with it is oxygen and our nutrients. So they're little things that can pass through the capillary wall. So this is a good thing, because we want oxygen and nutrients to get into the interstitial space so we can deliver them to our cells. So you think of the cells, they're kind of a bit lazy and they just want to Netflix and chill and they want things delivered. So our arterial side is like Uber Eats and we want to have filtration to deliver our oxygen and nutrients to our cells. Then, as we keep moving along the capillary and we get to the venous end, you can imagine the further we go along a hose, if things are leaking out, the more that leaks out, eventually the pressure is going to start to drop and drop and drop. So when we get to the 
venous side of the capillaries, our blood hydrostatic pressure is probably dropped to around 20-ish because we've lost fluid, so we've lost pressure. And our blood osmotic pressure is about the same because our big stuff, our red and white blood cells, platelets and albumin, they haven't left, so they're still there. So now the opposite happens and we've got a net pressure drawing into the capillary, about five-ish. So this is good because remember, the cells are lazy, they're Netflix and chill, Uber Eats comes in and our oxygen and nutrition come into the cell. So now we get reabsorption of fluids and CO2 and our waste products back into the capillary on the venous side so now it can return back to circulation. So this is our rubbish and recycling. Gorgeous. There we have Starling's forces and Starling's law of capillaries and capillary exchange. Beautiful. And you see how there's going to be the difference of maybe the pressure of 5 going back in versus the pressure of maybe 10 going out, which means we're going to be left with uh, 5 left in the interstitial space. But remember, we've got our lymphatic system, which mops up any excess there to keep the balance. Okay, so now what happens when things go wrong? If we have a look at heart failure, if the right side of our heart struggles to pump blood away from our body towards the lungs, then that blood is going to start building up in the body, so in the capillary system of our systemic circulation. So if this happens, we get um, a buildup of fluid back here, so this is going to increase our blood hydrostatic pressure. So in doing so, we're going to have more force that's pushing fluid out of our capillaries. And this is going to lead to edema. So peripheral edema, ascites. And then if our left side of our heart fails, so remember the left side of the heart, it pumps blood from the lungs to the body. So if it's failing in its job and not clearing that blood to the body, it's going to build up in the lungs. So now in our pulmonary circulation, the same thing happens. We get a buildup of hydrostatic pressure, and therefore we're going to get fluid developing in the interstitial space of our lungs. All right, next one, inflammation. So if we damage the cells, then we're going to release inflammatory mediators like histamine. What histamine does is it dilates, it vasodilates, so our arterial and venous ends are going to open up, and this is going to mean more blood flow to that area of capillary. So these capillaries, again, their blood hydrostatic pressure is going to increase, so therefore we're going to get more movement of fluid outside of our capillaries into our interstitial space. But the other thing our inflammatory mediators do is they cause increased capillary permeability. So as we vasodilate, as we open up, we also open up holes for substances to move out. So if we make the capillary more permeable, now, along with fluid leaking out, we're also going to get proteins leaking out. So this is a good thing because if we're dealing with an infection or a pathogen, then for our white blood cells to now be able to leave, that's good because they can fight the pathogen. But how this affects fluid movement is remember our proteins inside our capillary, they were part of our osmotic pressure drawing fluid back in to the capillary. So now if they leave out to fight the pathogen because we've got increased capillary permeability, then they're going to contribute to oncotic pressure, osmotic pressure in the interstitial space. So therefore fluid is now going to be drawn outside the cell even more. What else do we have? So liver failure, malnutrition. So our liver's job is to create 
albumin, which is one of our proteins, in here, if our liver fails, or we have malnutrition and we've got decreased albumin, now we've got decreased blood osmotic pressure to draw fluid back into our capillaries. So again, this is going to lead to fluid leaving and staying outside in our interstitial space. Same thing with our nephrotic syndrome. If our kidneys are struggling, then we're going to lose protein in our urine, which means we're going to have less protein in our capillaries and therefore decreased osmotic pressure and therefore less pulling of fluid back into our capillary. So therefore we're going to lose more fluid out of the interstitial space. Another thing that could affect it, if we had a tumour in our venous or lymphatic system, so if we've got a tumour blocking this or blocking this, then that's going to impede flow away from the area. So therefore we're going to have more hydrostatic pressure in our capillary because our venous end is blocked so therefore more fluid leaving the capillaries. Whereas in our lymphatic system, a lymphatic system is clearing up proteins and fluid that may have left the capillary and entered the interstitial space. If our lymphatic system is clogged, therefore we won't be able to clear the interstitial space. So we'll get a buildup of hydrostatic pressure in our interstitial space. All right, team, there we go. Starling's forces, Starling's law of capillaries, and capillary exchange. Happy studying.